So once again, I mean, welcome uh, everyone to the Crypto Valley Association virtual series uh, titled Tokenization, the next wave of mass adoption. So I'll be your host uh, this evening and we'll be moderating an extraordinary panel uh, of industry leaders. So we have Stefan Meyer, uh, co-founder of FQX, uh, Patrick Stettler, uh, head of sales EMEA of STX, and Klaus Scanning, uh, CEO of DigiShares. Uh, and of course, uh, none of this could be done without the support of our very own co-executive director, uh, Nikki Zani, who's in the back end here helping us uh, coordinate uh, everything as well. Um, so we have just under an hour. So I, I propose we, we just dive uh, straight in. I'm sure there's, uh, everyone is joining uh, slowly but surely. Um, so let's kind of get, get started. Maybe, uh, Stefan, if you'd like to kick us uh, off today and you can provide a short introduction about yourself, what got you involved in the digital space and, and maybe a little bit about FQX uh, as well. Super, thanks, happy to do so. So I'm uh, Stefan, I'm sitting at the moment on the Mount Rigi. I hope the, the connection is nonetheless fine. I'm uh, based uh, usually in uh, Zurich. I'm an attorney at law in, in Switzerland. I've been working a couple of years in the insurance industry and then I moved back to academia for a PhD on uh, blockchain and securities law. So how can you optimally uh, tokenize assets from a legal perspective? And I completed this uh, 2019. And I've been working uh, now in the meanwhile five years with uh, MME's uh, DLT team, also mostly on uh, tokenization projects from blockchain-based equity to derivatives to kind of real estate in, in Dubai. So quite a broad range. And uh, as of 2019, I uh, co-founded together with three colleagues uh, FQX, so we are uh, a Swiss-based, but now in the meanwhile, a global company with around uh, 25 employees. And we are focusing on one of the most traditional and standardized debt instruments, so the, the promissory note. And we have built an integrable so-called e-note transaction engine allowing uh, to create those instruments. And this e-note transaction engine can be integrated into any financing platform. So we have uh, now... The meanwhile, for example, a leading European money market uh, platform having integrated e-notes, a new crypto uh, stable coin lending platform. And then it, in very short, it usually always works, uh, work, usually works in a similar manner. So you have negotiation on a financing platform as soon as the parties agree to a transaction. And it's very similar to a PayPal checkout. Uh, so with the only difference that the result is you issue a tokenized so-called e-note. And this e-note can then be stored either on a DLT or uh, if, for example, within uh, CSDs. And here we are uh, working closely together with uh, specifically SDX. And we have a, a very nice and promising model how you can then bring those e-notes into SDX. Uh, maybe as a last remark, um, but then I've already talked a lot. Uh, I'm also leading, uh, I'm lecturing at two Swiss universities on, on the intersection of blockchain and law. I'm leading at the University of Lucerne, the, the master course on uh, blockchain and smart contracts for the law students, and then also from time to time at uh, ZHW and HVZ. And with this, Fantastic. happy to hand over to my colleagues. <laughs> Stefan, thank you so much uh, for all of that, and I'm really looking forward to discovering more about the e-note and also your, your collaboration with SDX. Maybe that's a good uh, transition. Uh, Patrick, if you'd like to tell our audience a little bit about your, yourself and, of course, the company. Yes, uh, thank you, Jaras. Um, Patrick Settler, my name. I'm uh, with uh, SDX now for three years. Uh, I have a background in capital markets for 25 years. So you see, and I, I've got some gray hair. That means I've been here for a while. Um, so I'm actually one of the traditionalists, I would like, I, as I would call myself. But uh, at the same time, uh, I'm a very curious person. And I believe in actively shaping uh, the future. So um, I always believe that what brought us here won't bring us there. I was in trading market making uh, for many years originally. And I, 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 in my time in the capital, capital markets, I was also in sales and structuring for, for quite, a, quite some years. And during that time, I was also involved and in actually co-building and co-architecting several platforms around um, uh, uh, investment structuring and then automation. And I was always a strong believer in doing things better, faster, um, cheaper, or actually and more efficient to get better qualities um, know, out of uh, know, for clients. Then um, and I, at some point in time, I just realized that the technology part of thing was going to change substantially with the advent of the DLT blockchains. 
So I, I strongly believe that these new technologies will, over time, you know, not very easy to predict how quickly and in what sequence, but these technologies will change the way banking, the capital markets work. And therefore, I was um, you know, joining SDX three years ago because I thought that's, that's really uh, a key project and a key um, uh, endeavor. And therefore, at SDX, I'm, I'm very happy to be there. I'm heading the sales and relationship management team. And uh, I have the pleasure and honor to work with capable people like Stefan and, and his team and his group. And uh, we see a lot of things and I'm very happy to, let's say, represent one fragment of the entire market, which is so big and so colorful and, and, and uh, no dizzying. So uh, happy to be here. Thank you. First of all, well, thank you. And hopefully we get a chance in this, in this hour to explore some of those uh, colors uh, as well. But before we do, uh, Klaus, please, uh, if you would like to introduce yourself as well. Yeah, great great place to be here today and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Uh, my name is uh, Klaus. I'm the CEO of uh, DDCS. I also have a background similar to Stefan. Uh, I was a re researcher to begin with. I have a PhD in computer science, but I went into business uh, quite soon after that. I wasn't uh, so heavy in academia. Uh, so I, I actually, I joined Hewlett Packard HP uh, uh, for uh, some years as, as a kind of technical lead on a project and uh, took that to become a spin out of, of HP and was the CEO for that for more than 10 years. And that sort of became my first company and my first exit. And then since then I've started another three or four companies and uh, ending with this company, DDCS, uh, founding that around four years ago. and. Uh, taking it now to around 30 employees and uh, quite good uh, business uh, traction. So I, I bought my first Bitcoin in 2014 and that was sort of my entry into this space here. I, I think I paid $200 for it or something like that. And I didn't tell my wife because I was afraid she, she would think I was a complete uh, fool. But uh, I, I told her later when it increased in, in value, but unfortunately I bought only one. But it 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 allowed me to start interest, start an interest in the blockchain space, and to slowly learn more and more until I, I stood uh, basically without a job around five years ago and uh, looking for new career opportunities. So, I, I basically selected the blockchain space as a kind of career path for me and uh, started together with some good friends to look for business opportunities and, uh, and places where we could make a difference and, and add value. So we actually started different projects, but eventually found out that uh, providing infrastructure for tokenization might be a really good niche to focus on. Um, when we started four years ago, there weren't really any good providers in the space. The, the solutions were really, really simple and we thought that we could potentially do it better. Um, so, um, so we uh, we uh, we we founded uh, DigiShares and basically as a kind of uh, infrastructure technology provider to the tokenization space. Uh, we we have a focus on real estate. Most of the tokenization projects we do are with real estate developers, but we also work with other other assets uh, today. But but the the basic value proposition that we uh, approach that we try to resolve is to assist the real estate developers to modernize and digitize and automate their internal business processes in relation to financing new projects uh, and the corporate management of the shareholder group over time. And then we also help them to make their assets much more liquid in, in different ways. One is through our inter own internal uh, marketplace for trading internally within each project. Another angle is to collaborate with exchanges such as, such as SDX, right? So tokenize on our platform and then list it on, on an exchange like SDX. Um, so that's, that's what we are working on. We have around 60 clients now and uh, we see huge demand. So even though tokenization had, has taken some time to, to take off, now it, it, it really is taking off. Uh, we see uh, very strong demand um, and, and, and it's been growing, I think, uh, steadily for the last two years or something like that. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank Fantastic. You. Well, yeah, th no, thank you. And yeah, really looking forward to hearing more about where that demand is coming from um, as well. So um, as the audience have been able to see, I mean, we have some incredibly bright minds speaking today. So uh, feel free uh, to just start picking their brains at any moment if you want to write any of your questions uh, in the chat box below. And I'm sure we'll be able to tackle uh, them in, in due course. Um, 
So maybe Klaus, uh, you, you can kick us off here. Uh, and to my belief, I mean, a good one would be to shed some light on some of the differences in terminology here. I mean, we talk about tokenization, digitalization and, and the likes. I mean, are those two synonymous so they have different meanings? Maybe you can, you can help uh, with this a little bit. To, to, sorry, uh, tokenization and what was the other term? Uh, digitalization. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. Um, so, so digitization is, is is everything you do to to uh, to digitize a working process, right, a workflow. So, just you could say the electronic signing of of a document or a contract is is a digitization of of a work workflow or work process. Um, tokenization goes much further than that, right? So we are basically building on top of securitization, which I think was was very popular some some years ago, where you 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 have an asset, an underlying asset like a real estate property, a hotel, a hospital, or some villas. Then you you basically create a legal unit that owns these properties, so you can actually issue shares corresponding to the ownership of those assets, and that's securitization, right? The next step then is to to digitize. The shares you can do that using yeah many different uh, properties like an exchange or in a bank and so on. You can digitize the shares and you can work with them in a, in a in a digital manner. But now we're tokenizing them. That means we are actually representing the shares with tokens. So you can have the token in your own wallet. You can keep it in custody. You can have it traded on exchange. You can use it as collateral for DeFi lending. Uh, but but essentially the share at the end of the day is represented by a token, which gives you a lot of benefits because you can then you can self custody it and you can transact on it with it yourself in a peer to peer fashion with other counterparties. Right, the blockchain technology allows you to do that extremely efficiently and uh, um, in trade without counterparty risk and and so on. So there's a lot of benefits. Fantastic. Um, Stefan, I feel like you, you want to jump in there. Uh. And, um, uh, to, to highlight uh, what, what Klaus said, I think one main character characteristic of tokenization is to create unique, rivalous electronic records. So that's a, a difference to just digitize it. You create a unique electronic record, which is able to exclusive control. So you can, I as a holder of this uh, electronic can exclusively control uh, the instrument and I can also easily transfer the instrument by transferring the control. And I think this is this makes it a, a very elegant technology and basis in order to transfer any type of asset from securities to other financial instruments, to real estate, as we heard, or to uh, art or, or, uh, or other use cases. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, and, and maybe, uh, Stefan, on, on that note, and... Uh through FQX that you just recently uh, mentioned before, the release of, of, of eNote, uh, which is based on, on blockchain technology. Maybe you can tell us more about that innovation and the importance of it uh, as well. Yes, absolutely. So uh, what we are leveraging is uh, one of the, the oldest, most standardized legal instruments in the world, the, the promissory note, which is in essence an unconditional promise to pay. In German, for, for the German, maybe one of the other German person here, it's the so-called Eigenwechsel. So the, the instrument almost died out because you had the legal requirement needing a paper-based uh, certificate and a handwritten signature. Nonetheless, you have, uh, from a legal and accounting perspective, you have a lot of advantages coming out of this instrument. And uh, what has now obviously changed in the meanwhile is uh, that the legal basis allowing now to uh, issue those instruments purely electronically. And we at FKX, we're doing this uh, based on either Delaware law or Singapore law. We're also now leveraging uh, the, the new Swiss uh, legislation, but the scope uh, is a bit narrower in, in this regard. And then uh, in, in essence, uh, our main end users are businesses. And we have, uh, for example, publicly listed companies issuing the instrument on the investor side. We have uh, institutional investors and buying the instruments. Uh, we also have, to, for example, Credit Suisse uh, doing transactions by, by using e-notes. And uh, the, the, the charm of the instrument is it's uh, so generic. You can use it uh, in loan scenarios. You can use it in a more commercial paper-like program scenario. You can use it as a buyer in order to pay your supplier. So then it's a pure payment instrument and not a credit instrument. And uh, this is what uh, makes the instrument very, very appealing. And then uh, also it's a globally standardized legal basis. So you can use the same instrument in Europe, in Asia, in the US, 
and therefore the, it makes the, the whole case also very scalable. And having done quite a lot of uh, tokenization projects, for example, if you're focusing on equity, then you always end up with one jurisdiction. You have certain uh, specific, uh, specifics regarding this, uh, this jurisdiction, specific requirements. And now focusing on a global instrument, uh, you can really leverage also the, the global access of the, of the technology. And uh, we started with uh, basing or building up on a private DLT. So it's a, it was a hyper fabric DLT. We are now shifting uh, towards uh, public permissionless DLTs. And uh, we, start, uh, we just started with uh, Solana and we also support uh, other or EVM blockchains. And then maybe as a last, uh, as a last point, uh, our users can then really choose the infrastructure on which the instrument should be stored. And you can either opt for super modern, fancy Solana, maybe on the one side of the spectrum, or you can, if you have uh, also maybe more regulatory requirements, you can say, I do want to have it within a, a CSD. And then in regard to CSDs, I think SDX is a, is a perfect fit because they're uh, very efficient. They're, uh, will also allow a direct uh, settlement of the instruments, so not T plus two in a, in a very easy and elegant manner. Um, and so therefore we, yeah, as said, we're very happy to be able to, to work together with SDX. Yeah, fantastic. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about uh, that, that partnership uh, as well, and maybe kind of, let's say, uh, unravel some of those maybe kind of complicated acronyms that you just mentioned as well to kind of uh, ease it on, on the audience uh, a, a little bit. So, yeah. Um, and so maybe, uh, Patrick, you can tell us more about uh, the, the, this announcement with FQX and, and SDX and, and kind of the importance of six and SIX's involvement in digital assets as well. Uh, yes, very happy to do so. I, might, I would maybe just like to go one step back to, and uh, just pick up something that uh, Stefan brought up, something uh, that is very important. Um, the, 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 the legal aspects, they can only be underestimated. When we talk about tokenization, then we tend, all right, or we tend to think just about it just in technology terms, saying, yeah, you know, I tokenize this, I tokenize that. Technically, that is not necessarily a very difficult thing to do. However, um, making sure that when you have an asset or other when you're, well, let's say when you're an equity holder uh, of a specific company, then you have to make sure that the token truly represents and holds all the rights that are attached to, to, to that holding, right? To make sure that you can really exercise your right and that they're undisputably exercisable when you are, let's say, the owner of that token. And that's not always so simple. And it's, uh, it's in many cases, not a technical question per se, because there is still, there's law that predicates some things and uh, that, that, are, that are, let's say, that, that is the legal foundation uh, for, for what we do. So the, what Stefan said is that the, the, um, the nodes, that have, that are based on a global right sort of that's very very important because that means you can scale it right whereas if you are talking about um, asset tokens let's say equity tokens when you look at the 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 the, the, leg the legislations then these legislations actually vary from country to country. So there is no such thing as a one size fits all. So it means you have to still adapt in some way or shape to local law. And therefore, and, and I, I, I just wanted to bring this point across, I think technology uh, in many cases is already advanced, but um, there's there's some boundaries that let's say prohibit the full or exploit the maximum uh, use of this technology because there's still law, there's still regulation in some way or shape, and uh, well that will not go away, right? And and in in most cases also for good reasons. Now with that, let me just bridge to to what SDX um, decided to do. So we are a 100% uh, subsidiary of Six. And we started in 2018, realizing that there's a, a lot of change to come that will hit capital markets um, and, and the way things are done, the way assets are represented, et cetera, et cetera. By design, uh, it was, we, we sort of determined that we want to be start in the regulated corner, right? So we could say there's the open blockchain area and there's, let's say, the, 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 let's say the permissioned area fully regulated. 
we said we start here uh, not claiming that this is the only way or the only right way. It's a way. And uh, the reason for that is we wanted to sort of build an infrastructure that um, existing uh, capital market participants can actually connect in 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 uh, in, in, uh, in good faith. And so we want to make we want to make sure that we are a trustworthy infrastructure that is regulated, that has full oversight from our local regulator, FINMA, um, and uh, by that also demonstrating that we comply with all the security um, on our requirements, cyber risk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that comes at a price. That means there's certain things you cannot do. And uh, let's say you have a bit less flexibility in terms of which assets or asset tokens you can then bring on the platform. But we thought this is, it's worth the price to, let's say, start with equities and bond instruments or fixed income instruments and start from there. And of course, there are many other corners or regions uh, on the landscape, like the NFTs, et cetera, et cetera, that we don't have readily available. But as, uh, as there is a commercial demand from the market, we would be adding that, of course, right? But um, time will tell, and there will be a sequence of new asset classes that we add. And um, yeah, so the, and also to maybe close the loop, the, the, the security tokens or the asset tokens that uh, could be either equities or bond instruments, um, technically speaking, there are these are the tokens on Corda platform that we are using. Legally, these are intermediated securities, right? It's a well-trusted uh, legal concept in Switzerland. Um, it's, a, it's intermediated securities. So if you look at the Nestle shares, for instance, these are also intermediated securities. So we wanted to make sure that uh, the institutional players in the market feel safe with, with what we do and sort of also then uh, accommodate, them with, uh, accommodate them with the technology that we are building. And then over the years, then uh, very, very likely this will open up and go in many new different or additional ways um, uh, and harnessing other asset classes, uh, other platforms, et cetera, et cetera. So the, and, and the uh, cooperation, uh, the, the work we're doing with FTX is actually uh, something uh, that I consider a very good fit because when you look at the asset life cycle, there is a point where you do an issuance. So when you create a token, and then there is trading and uh, life cycle management. So there could be coupons, there could be dividends, there could be anything of that sort, right? And this, uh, for some instruments, there is a maturity. What we do not have actually uh, on our platform right now is everything that is pre-issuance. So when the instrument is being designed, when you do book building, when you do all of that, right? When you sort of write the prospectus or when you describe the asset. And this is exactly where FQX comes in. They have a very neat platform and they really complement what we already have, right? And so that's sort of the key connection. And if you think of the FQX platform as a, as a platform that really creates new tailor-made assets for specific needs, then they could then in a in a seamless step enter the SDX platform where they can be made available for all those that are uh, connected to to um, to SDX. Mm -hmm. So that was a very long mm -hmm. short summary. Sorry for that. <laughs> very insightful, uh, really, and I think that that bridges well on to, to another topic whereby, uh, of course, the digitalization of financial products like these. I mean, it's an important step for this technological revolution, but we can't forget kind of real world assets too. And I mean, Klaus, you spoke a little bit about these uh, before, and I know that you've been working on a lot of real estate tokenization for some time now. I mean, how does that asset class compare to what we've just uh, been speaking about? Yeah, well, I have to say, I fully agree with Patrick. Uh, just today, actually, uh, we spoke to a client and they call us a legal tech company, right? Even though we only have one legal guy and 15 software developers, but it, it just, it just, uh, it, it, it just under highlights the point that it, it's we are so influenced by regulation and everything we, we do is yeah is is, uh, is influenced and uh, and uh, a lot of <laughs> it has to be compliant everything we do we work within securities regulation right that um, 
So even though we have one legal guy, we have 40 legal partners around the world in order to carry out our projects, right? So it's, there's a lot of legal effort going into this and it's also still making it quite expensive to, to tokenize in many geographies because uh, there is a legal bill to pay as well. In many cases, you have to interface with a regulator uh, in a sandbox process, or at least to, to uh, discuss with them and notify them what you're doing and get some kind of permission. Um, so it's, but it's moving forward, I would say. So more and more jurisdictions are opening up to tokenization that is becoming uh, clear and clarified in, in more and more countries, how you can actually tokenize. So we, uh, we like to work in the US because it's one big country and the, the regulation is, is the same all over the country. Uh, so we see the US currently as, as taking the lead in this space. If you, uh, if you use a Wyoming based, uh, company to tokenize you can you can use the tokens in, in all the other states and uh, it's a uh, it's a big market so that's also where we see the biggest interest and uh, the, the the most interesting projects right now um, in europe it's a much more uh, fragmented uh, pattern uh, it's a patchwork of regulation in different countries but uh, but uh, the the european union uh, bringing in regulation and uh, sort of converging uh, over the next uh, one or two years, uh, I think for, for sure. And currently Germany taking the lead, I think for the most forward looking regulation in the space. And uh, we, are, we have a German subsidiary. So we are also trying to be close to what is happening with the law and to, to be, make sure our customers can stay compliant. Um, the way that we uh, operate when we tokenize real estate is, as earlier mentioned, to tokenize an SPV, a legal unit that owns the property and then tokenize the shares of that company. Tokenizing the shares is, is, from our perspective, the easiest to do right now because a share is, is, uh, is well understood in the regulation and, and many regulators, or at least some regulators, view tokenization as just a way to digitize the share. And that's already supported to some degree or even completely in many countries. Uh, so the token is just one step uh, further where you actually have a token that represents the share. It's not equal to the share, but it represents the share and it allows you to update the share cap table, uh, which is then the, the legally valid indicator of where, the, where the, the ownership resides. So that we can work with that approach in the US, in, in Denmark and uh, in more and more countries. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but it's developing all the time and uh, it's, it's a moving target and uh, we have to spend a lot of time on it, but. Uh, um, I think it's moving in the right direction uh, where the regulators uh, in, in many cases uh, choose to see tokenization of securities as just a digital version of the securities really and, and nothing, nothing, nothing special in addition to that. Klaus, I have a question if I may. So when you say you're actually tokenizing the shares that holds the building, or let's say, yeah, let's let's say there's this building. Um, what would it take, and 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 what would it, and how long would that take to, let's say, tokenize that building directly without the use of this SPV in the middle? Let's say, okay, this is the building, and now let me represent that in a tokenized form on a chain. Are we getting there? And, and not yet. Not yet. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, you have to tokenize then some kind of investment contract around the building, linking, linking, being linked to the title of the deed, and also potentially having to integrate with a land title registry, which is not digital anywhere in the world. Um, and you have to convince the investors to to read and understand this very long investment contract regulating value appreciation, distribution of income, and so on rather than just selling them a share, which is a recognized security. Um, so we see, we see some, we see a few companies looking at it this way. And I think that it will come in the future, right? But, but um, it, it's too early, I think now. Mm. Thank you. Mm. That's um, too early. I feel like that's a sentence we've been hearing for the past uh, <laughs> a couple, couple of years, uh, at least, I mean, uh, Stefan, maybe you can, you can even comment on, on why you believe it's taken taken so long, um, and maybe even not so long, but I guess in the crypto space, everything moves so quick, so it feels long uh, to, to, to me, at least. <laughs> I think one, one aspect has been mentioned that uh, so, so one requirement and basis which is needed is the law. So especially for uh, security tokens and for tokenizations, you 
uh, as Patrick said, uh, you need a proper legal basis. Otherwise, just uh, do it technically. It's not sufficient. So we needed a while in order to have the proper uh, legal basis. And now um, I think it's also a bit of a hurdle to convince uh, more traditional businesses, for example, to uh, use uh, DLT, especially in our segment. Uh, so if you're, you're focusing on uh, even uh, publicly listed companies, so it, it took a little bit uh, of an effort to convince them to shift uh, towards uh, using DLT. Now in the meanwhile, it, uh, it works uh, it works very well. So therefore, uh, this was also a, a hurdle which we, we had to overcome. Um, and I'm very much convinced that the tokenization will be more and more important. I think one additional aspect is also that you do, you do not only need the title side, you also need the money side. And now we have more and more stable coins. We are even discussing uh, CBDC. And if you have then uh, both the, the title and the money and you can uh, very efficiently directly exchange the instruments, then it's, uh, it's all the more interesting. So I think this was also an, an additional driver we now have. And uh, therefore, I, I think it's a, it's a huge, there's a huge potential in, uh, in various areas. I, I absolutely agree. Real estate is kind of the... The, the one uh, main topic in the, the more property area, I think nonetheless financial instruments in general are, are very efficient. And it just provides a tool to very efficiently and directly transfer assets, be it in a B2B model, but also in a peer-to-peer -peer B2C model, so in a, in a full spectrum. Um, I think the, the only aspect which might be a bit worrying is the regulation. So we also see now that uh, more and more regulation is coming. Uh, not all the regulation is going into, at least from my perspective, an optimal uh, way. It's also a lot of education needed in order to, to teach those people then, uh, then uh, creating a regulation that they understand how the technology works, what the use cases are. And we see it in... We, we had the, or the, the European uh, Union had the discussion this week. Uh, there are um, projects like the, the Basel Committee um, foreseeing very high capital uh, requirements for financial institutions holding any type of crypto related assets. Um, we also see more and more regulation at the gateways between uh, crypto and fiat so that in the future you might not be able anymore to um, switch uh, fiat uh, uh, crypto towards fiat if you not uh, if you're not based on a on a fully white listed KYC uh, uh, wallet. So here uh, we there yeah this is the challenge to, to find the optimal the optimal amount of uh, regulation. The optimal amount, uh, but that's a bit. I mean, uh, Patrick, SDX just well just they, they got their regulatory approval last September. I mean, how have you been progressing since that part? I mean, I'm sure that has opened a lot of doors uh, since. Absolutely, absolutely. Look, uh, the, the the Swiss environment is a very supportive environment. We had um, that, that that was quite a long journey to. Um, to kind of actually talk uh, with FINMA and our uh, home regulator um, to finally get the approval. And they just did the right thing. They wanted to understand how we are applying the technology, uh, making sure that it's, it's, uh, it's waterproof. And that takes, that takes some time. So that was an investment. And uh, well, no, let's, not, let's not forget, the last time they, they, let's say, approved or gave the approval to uh, an exchange or of that sort, that's, that's, that's probably about two decades uh, ago. So right? that's not something you do every, every week or every, not even every year. So yes, this has opened doors, but that um, as all these platforms, and I think well, as we figure out, you know, that's, that was just the birth of the baby. Now there's this potential that out there that we can now start explaining, but that's not really... Um, and I, uh, no, that takes a bit of time. So we have onboarded to the platform already Credit Suisse, UBS, and Zurich Cantonal Bank. And, uh, and of course, we will be adding uh, other, uh, other uh, banks or other financial institutions uh, for, to grow the network. So that's one dimension. And the other dimension is adding new or actually more products and adding more assets, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that we just did the start, we just came out of the gate and uh, look, the, the, the requests or the ideas that are coming towards 
Spartas are actually enormous and super interesting. Uh, we just talked about the um, E note uh, before. And what I realize is really, um, there's now a bit back to tokenization. When you look at the, the uh, blue chip equity markets, for instance, there is like, that interest is not really that high, at least not for now, because these markets are already highly efficient and highly you know, straight through. Um, and yes, there can be that. There, there's still a couple of things that can be done better, more efficiently, like the corporate actions handling and, and these kind of things. Um, but that will take some time. But um, these markets on the trading side, they are um, facilitated in, in sub micro or sub millisecond uh, time frame. So the, the a technology that is based on DLT is not yet so uh, that performant that you could really facilitate you know, transactions at this lightning speed. So where I see the most interest is really in the private markets area. Right, the things that are not publicly listed, or or let's say uh, no, at less at least less frequently traded. So, and I think there's where uh, technology, including us as an infrastructure provider, can add a lot of value. Those areas where we have capital markets not yet organized that efficiently, where where things are paper-based, where they function manually, uh, where let's say where you have your holding on a piece of paper in your safe, but there is no account statement at your bank. So there is no, not, not a holistic view on your wealth and all these kind of things. And uh, I think these the, the private markets, be it private debt, be it private equity, um, that's where I believe uh, we will see an enormous growth um, over the coming years. Very difficult to predict the exact order and speed because we know there's a, that we have a, we have an environment that we have and want to comply with. But um, based on the interest I see, uh, I, I I'm sure that this we are we are going to see a lot that will happen. Exciting. I mean, you spoke a lot about the financial institution side, right? Big banks, UBS, Credit Suisse, Zurich Cantonal Bank, but. What is your perspective on more the retail audience, right? In terms of, I remember back in the day when I was sold the dream of uh, tokenization, it was for anyone, anywhere to buy anything, right? And that being even with 10 francs in their pocket, are, are we approaching a reality like this at, at any time soon? Or are these kind of illiquid assets going to become liquid only for uh, institutions? Yeah, that's a good question. Look, I can now, for talking for STX or the way we are set up, at least for now, I don't know how, I don't have the crystal ball uh, seeing the future in five or 10 years from now. Um, for now, because we are regulated, um, only regulated financial institutions are, let's say, eligible to connect to this network. Let's say, let's call that through a wallet. We call it a node, but um, that's, that's a requirement today. That could change over time, and it probably will. And uh, on the other side, you have the public blockchain, right? Where actually everyone could have a wallet. In our case, because it's a permission blockchain, this is not the case. But therefore, I say this is a starting point um, in, in, in sort of this walled garden for now, but in a very controlled and, uh, let's say, high quality and institutional grade way. There's the public blockchain space, right? Where you have a different environment, um, a, a different community and different ideas. Most likely over time, you know, these are going to converge, right? The, so the, we are going to learn from the public blockchain space and public blockchain space will probably adopt some concepts from the regulated space that have proven as, as valid. Uh, and the speed at which these are maybe going to converge, that's open, we will figure out. And, uh, and by that, maybe let me add the thought that even though the cryptos are out there for now a bit more than 10 years, I mean, uh, at least uh, in, in the case of Bitcoin, when we look at asset tokenization, my personal view is all of that is still very early. It's still very young, right? And uh, we are not really very far in that journey. So I would say all the funny and really interesting things are yet to come. Okay, it's interesting. You spoke about convergence, right? And that you're regulated, so you can only deal with regulated uh, institutions. So are you saying to a certain extent that 
being centralized in that manner allows you to operate with those entities. But then, uh, for example, decentralized exchanges, uh, some uh, projects such as Ravencoin, for example, operating tokenization in uh, a decentralized way, allowing the offering for retail audiences will kind of that they, they will have their market on that side and you will have yours and maybe there'll be some overlap, but the ability to kind of trade these assets will be on one exchange for, for some and then on another for another audience type. I mean, Stefan and Klaus, please uh, jump in or, or Patrick yourself, but yeah, just intrigued to hear. But, but maybe just one thought to that. The, on uh, when, when it comes to the assets trade on, on STX, of course, on a private investors or corporates, they can uh, actually try these instruments just through their banks, not directly, let's say, through their wallet. So, right, everyone that is connected in that network, uh, the private investors, they can access these, these instruments, right? So, it's um, th th that is open, but um, you have to be connected to the network in some way or shape. I think the other point you brought up, um, Shiraz, is about interoperability. And to me, I would say that's the, the $1 million question. Now, and when you think about interoperability, also here, it's quite easily said, yeah, let's make this up interoperable. Let's say, let, let's connect this and this network, and then, uh, then everything will be fine. But the devil is really in the detail. And when you now think about, um, you have a note, uh, uh, let's say an e-note, just as an example, and there will be, a, there, there's a coupon that is going to be distributed. Now, when you have this coupon, let's say, hop over a couple of networks, then you have to, yeah, really have to make sure that it really is disseminated in in, in just in, in in a perfect way. Otherwise, it could be that some do not receive that coupon; others might receive it twice. Um, well, a part of that coupon could actually disappear in Nirvana, and then you are bearing a lot of legal risks, right? So the owners that are expecting that coupon from you, maybe on the third network, they would then. You know, hold like a claim probably against someone saying, hey, you owe me some coupon. What I want to say with that, my personal opinion is uh, interoperability until it's really investment grade um, will probably still take a while. And to, it's easier to, said than yeah, I, I, I fully agree. Also, specifically in regard to this aspect of uh, interoperability it's a it's a word which is used uh, quite uh, quite often but as you said you really have to go into details in in regard to the the different types of exchanges and also the, the allowed participants from from my perspective there is definitely room for both on the one side you have uh, sdx which is uh, fully regulated providing all the services relevant for banks as institutional investors you have everything you need, you fulfill all your regulatory requirements, it's nonetheless very efficient. So this is one, one segment. Uh, from, from our perspective, we also provide the possibility to directly issue and uh, store the instrument on a, even on a public permissionless DLT. So for an other type of uh, audience having other uh, requirements, which might do directly exclusively, exclusively control the instruments uh, by themselves. And there you then, of course, also have uh, other, other trading uh, platforms. Um, in regard to, to, the, to the law, uh, we also see a certain shift there. Switzerland now introduced the, the DLT trading facility as a license category. Uh, the difference there with this license is now it's now also allowed to have a, up to retail clients and investors as participants. So we also see this certain tendency from a, from a legal uh, perspective towards more open, more decentralized uh, systems. Can I comment? Can I is, can I comment also on the retail investor angle? Please, please. please. Uh, from from our perspective, it's really a no-brainer uh, that that the retail investors will come into the space big time. As as it is right now, the retail investors really don't have access to invest into real estate, which is our primary focus, right? It's, I think it's less than 2% of the global population that is invested into real estate, but industry reports indicate that it's more than 50% that actually would like to do it. They just don't have the, the access to it today. Um, it requires in, in Europe, like 100,000 euros and upwards if you want to invest in a real estate project. Um, and you can, of course, you can trade a few of them on the exchanges, but it's only a very limited amount of, 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 of assets and properties that are available. 
And, and typically, if you go into a real estate investment project, you will be stuck with, with your investment for six, seven, or eight years. So there's essentially no liquidity, right? So I think the tokenization um, uh, activity that, uh, that we are all uh, focused on will resolve that, that matter and will allow the, the retail investors to come into the space that they haven't done it yet. I think it's more a matter of awareness and education. They have to find out that they have the option and they have to have some, some goods on the, the shelves in the stores, right? There has to be some, some, uh, some available assets for them to actually invest into and maybe also some successful cases, right? So it's, it's going to take some time, but it'll come for sure. Fantastic. Uh, well, I think we're kind of getting in, into in the core of the webinar today with only just or only or just over 10 minutes uh, re remaining, um, which is, is tokenization going to be the next wave of, of mass adoption or are there elements uh, to that? Uh, I mean, maybe the next wave, which is a little bit further away, but I mean, because before entering uh, the webinar, we were discussing a little bit about the metaverse and potentially its implication within uh, tokenization. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on that area? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, th I think the metaverse is a huge buzzword, right? I would say first and foremost, and has been so for a while now, but I also think there is something tangible behind it, right? I think there is a real business opportunity for all of us and there are real use cases also that will, will be seen in the future uh, as virtual, real virtual reality and so on becomes better and better and better. So there's no doubt, we, we cannot just ignore it. We have to, to look at it as, as, a, as a new, way of doing business and uh, as a way to sort of stay relevant and uh, and uh, and develop new uh, areas of our business so so from our perspective we are looking very much at the uh, idea of creating digital twins of real physical properties and using that potentially as a kind of uh, ownership uh, indicator of the, the real physical property um, we are exploring that together with a few uh, uh, clients so i think this is definitely something we will see more and more in the future um so so yeah so from our perspective it's it's quite exciting and 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 will potentially be be of, of real value fantastic thank you um stefan please i i can tell that you're, you're gonna say that it is the next wave at least i hope so <laughs> thanks yes um you're absolutely right it is uh, the next wave also what makes it all the more interesting is that it's not only about tokenizing an asset. So you're not just digitizing, making an asset tradable. It's you, you have also below this asset, a super efficient infrastructure and tokenizing an asset also lies automation of a lot of processes. If you, for example, tokenize an equity share of a company, you can then very easily directly do, for example, a general assembly, all these voting uh, mechanisms, if you then uh, start tokenizing, for example, uh, a fund share, you can also build up a, a very efficient voting uh, model on the top. And then you, you really see a, a, a much bigger picture and that there is a, a lot of room and a, a lot of potential in, in this area. Okay. So this word, it was the, the, the more or less short, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Patrick, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I think the, look, I, I think it's mind boggling Right. What's uh, what's lying ahead of us? There is just uh, so many uh, so still things that could that can happen. And but there will be also interesting side effects. And uh, you alluded to that clause when you when you think about the metaverse and when you talk about physical or think about physical things, uh, maybe one way to look at that if the, the more you are going to tokenize physical assets it could be as small as this pen it could be as big as let's say maybe a car or a painting something that, that will be required then in this new world where you have more of that tokenization is 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 custody right so we we we, we sometimes tend or we should not forget about these very basic services that underlie this, this new metaverse when you are tokenizing things. Because if you are tokenizing that car or this picture, someone needs to make sure that it's being taken care of, right? Because someone else is holding the right to this, to this object. So I would say um, maybe as a business opportunity also, think in this new world, but don't forget uh, the, 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 the traditional qualities of the stuff we do. So even there, there could be good business opportunities. And uh, yeah. yeah. So. Quick comment to that. Uh, so there's been a lot of projects done with NFTs 
and and they haven't been taking good care of the custody angle because now we see actually a lot of cases where the NFTs are somehow disconnected from the underlying asset because there isn't a careful, carefully sought out mechanism for how to keeping that link available and and even for making it compliant. Right. So yes, I agree very much. No, very, very, very insightful. And, and we have 10, uh, just 10 minutes uh, left now. And, and I mean, I did mention that we were like going to allow our audience to, to ask a few questions and they have it in, in the chat box and I'm more than happy to, to un, uh, unmute uh, any individual if they want to kind of join in a little bit of kind of like a Zoom clubhouse in, in a way, uh, if they have any questions. So, so feel free to ask them in, in the chat. Um, we, we did have a few here and I'll just try and like uh, pick, pick one or two. Um, so we, we spoke a little bit about Switzerland. Um, Kelsey, you mentioned that you're, you've been operating a little bit in Singapore and, and in, in the US and now slowly into Switzerland, both Stefan and Patrick were both uh, Swiss-based. Uh, here, Kieran is asking, um, are there any upcoming developments regarding regulatory finality in Switzerland that would be helpful for, for us to know? Any, anything to look forward to that Switzerland is preparing uh, regarding uh, tokenization uh, at all to your awareness? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> I mean, what, what was introduced uh, last year was uh, the, the DLT register yeah. securities allowing you to digitize, tokenize various assets, including uh, physical ones. Yeah. Um, what has also been introduced is the DLT trading facility as a license category, which is also um, a, a useful tool for, for secondary market um, platforms. Uh, then Switzerland also adapted one or the, the other additional provision, which is just help in practice like the segregation of assets or crypto assets in bankruptcy proceedings so that we have compared to <clears throat> other or Switzerland as compared to other jurisdictions but a, a good legal basis in regard to DLT. Um, nonetheless uh, there are also in Switzerland quite some uh, yeah, a, a broader range of questions uh, are still open but it's also a, a new and highly evolving uh, topic. No, I understand. I mean, uh, maybe let's flip the question uh, on its head and say there might be some regulators, authorities in, in, in the webinar today. I mean, what if there was something that Switzerland could do to become either more competitive or more open to the tokenization world, the security token world? I mean, what, what, what could they do at, by at the same time? I mean, taking into consideration there needs to have some layer of protection, et cetera. I mean, what would you suggest to them uh, if they were right here in front of you today? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so from my personal perspective, uh, the, the collaboration with FEMA works very well. So they're very open. Of course, it could uh, take a little bit less time as, uh, as always. Nonetheless, they, they have a very elegant uh, procedure. And then I think specifically in regard to tokenization, we have a, a really good basis here, allowing a lot of tokenization mechanisms. And we, we have even more legal certainty now for tokens representing other assets than for native and payment tokens so um definitely we, uh, yeah so so we had a specific focus on this i think the only disadvantage specifically in switzerland is that there is no passporting if you need a, a prospectus so there's no passporting of the european union which is a disadvantage uh, if you have any type of b2c constellation I, I would actually just uh, I, I agree with this. Um, I, I, I fully agree. I think the, the the environment we have in Switzerland with FINMA is is super constructive, and uh, I think many other countries would envy us for that. Um, but anything that is about cross border, right? Um, these these kind of things they have been with us and they will, will remain with us. That that just does not go away. So there's only when I from from I would actually chime in with what Stefan said. There's only so much you can do here um, when you actually want to branch out of the Swiss market and harness, let's say, the the, the surroundings. Then it's always the cross border aspects that would um, that, that would come in uh, and come into play. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Um, and, and maybe this uh, next question uh, is for you here, uh, Klaus, uh, for, from Paul. Um, who, and it's related to, to real estate to tokenization. I mean, who is accountable for the maintenance of the physical real estate? I mean, you sell the tokens, that's all fine and dandy, but uh, the actual asset, I mean, where, where does the maintenance come from? I mean, how is that person paid? I mean, how does this uh, work in, in, in real life? 
it's the same as in, in real life. So, so again, you, you'd have some kind of SPV owning the property and potentially also having a budget for the, the maintenance, the ongoing maintenance and staff for that or uh, using a service provider. Uh, and then you tokenize less than 50% of that property, right? So you still keep the, the management of the property in the hands of the, of the, of the issuer. Uh, so that's a typical scenario, right? You can also sell off an entire asset and then of course the responsibility to, to manage it will cross over to someone else, but, but uh, it's, it's similar to, to real life. It doesn't make a difference to, to whether you tokenize it or not on, okay. that, on that perspective. Fair point. Uh, it's the same virtually or in yeah. real life. Uh, yeah. uh, fantastic. Um, and so I think John has an, another question here, which is quite quite an interesting one. I mean, how, how secure is tokenization and can the tokens be hacked? And maybe if I add another a caveat to that in terms of if there was a hack and, and the tokens were taken uh, by some hacker, I mean, I'm guessing that doesn't necessarily mean that they can appropriate that re that piece no. of real estate no. uh, at all. I mean, at least I hope. I mean, what is your perspective? I mean, uh, Klaus, is it secure? I mean, how does it differ? It is, it is really secure. <laughs> and I can guarantee that. The reason is that to have security tokens in your wallet, your wallet has to be whitelisted. So you have to, you have to provide your, your ID and be a, go through KYC in order to even keep the token in your wallet. The, wallet is, the token is self-regulating and, and self-governing, right? So it, it, it just doesn't allow to be transferred into a wallet that is not whitelisted. So, so first the, the thief would have to, or the hacker would have to be whitelisted with a wallet to be able to receive the token or somehow transfer it into the own token. And even if that was possible with a fake identity or something like that, the, the, the manager or the issuer can still override it and burn the tokens and reissue them to the correct wallet. And this is required. This you can't do this with Bitcoin, right? But you can do it with security tokens through because they use special protocols that allow this functionality, and it's it's required by law because it's a security. Hmm. Okay. Hopefully, there's no rogue property owners that just yeah. uh, sell the asset and tokens and then decide to burn everything and keep the yeah. <laughs> keep the asset. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a, that's another um, matter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but I do understand John's skepticism here in terms of you know when it comes to Kind of tokens you know everyone or a lot of people that i know that that bought bitcoin is like ah oh, but it's not really tangible it doesn't exist how can i really trust this right and i mean stefan patrick do you, do you have any thoughts on kind of like how to, like tokens representing real assets can kind of portray themselves in a more trusted way to to audiences that might not be aware of some of the things klaus mentioned i i think yeah, i i agree in in regard to what uh, what Klaus said, it's it is uh, very secure uh, and sec it has to be secure on a on a technical layer. It has to be secure on a legal layer, and then if you combine uh, the, these both aspects, then then you have a, a very a very good uh, basis. And as Klaus also said, uh, if you're dealing with asset tokens or tokenized assets, then you have more possibilities. Also, if you, for example, lose uh, the asset. In certain laws, as for example, the Swiss law, there's even a, a specific procedure foreseen, a so-called annulment of the instrument that you received an, a new one. So here in, in this uh, area of assets, it's uh, even, even more secure compared to uh, other more native uh, digital assets. Hmm. Okay, very interesting. Um, and that's it. Well, we're just about to, to wrap up here. I mean, uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time. So I think some really interesting insights. I hope uh, our, our audience was able to, to benefit from all of these. Um, do, do any of you have any closing remarks for our audience uh, today that have been listening so attentively to, to what you've, uh, you've had to say? I already provided mine that uh, we will see a major increase in uh, tokenized assets. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, I think, yeah, very brief for me. I think it's important for anyone, if the startups, but also institutional, larger companies to be exposed to this and try to learn what it is about and make form a business strategy around it uh, to avoid getting potentially disrupted in the future. Uh, my, my words, Klaus, thank you for that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
<laughs> well, well, great. Uh, ditto. And uh, it's be, been amazing, uh, once again, ha having all of you. So thank you so much for, for joining uh, one of the Crypto Valley Association's virtual uh, series. Uh, to the audience, I hope you really enjoyed the session here today. I, I definitely uh, did, and we'll have more sessions coming up in, in the following weeks and months. And of course, the Crypto Valley Conference uh, that is going to be in a few months' time. So make sure you, uh, you listen out for the announcements related to that and everything uh, that is to come. But uh, yeah, in the interim, uh, have a great evening. Thanks once again to uh, Klaus, Stefan and Patrick for joining us uh, today. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a great evening. Good evening.